everybody. I'm Allison Camerata. You may know me as a CNN anchor, but I'm also the mother of three teenagers. And that's what I want to talk to you all about on the Distraction Podcast. I well remember my own vivid teenage years, and I don't understand these new rules. I don't understand how we've gotten from free range 1980s. I was a free range kid. I went and did whatever I wanted. Basically, I was wildly self-sufficient to the helicopter parenting of today. And I don't like being a helicopter parent. I don't want to be a helicopter parent, but somehow I am a helicopter parent because that's what I think this era demands. And I see it among all my neighbors and all of my friends, and I just don't get it. I don't even know what kind of kids we're producing since we're helicopter parents and not letting them learn on their own and take risks and make mistakes and have, yeah, okay, some risky situations. I mean, I don't want them to obviously be dealing with drug abuse and, you know, alcohol abuse and getting into cars drunk, but I do want them to be able to have a few risks. And I worry that we have bubble wrapped them to the point of crippling them, frankly. So not only am I confounded about what the new rules of parenting in this helicopter parenting era are, but then add to it the pandemic. And we're all spending even more time together and at home and under one roof. And kids are even less free to go out and socialize and be on their own and be alone and be in school and all of that stuff. So it's just compounded I think all of our parenting woes and questions. So anyway, I have a bunch of guests that I'm really looking forward to hearing from about how to navigate all of this and we'll just go through it together. So today I want to share with you a conversation that I had with Real Housewife star, uh, Heather Dubrow. Heather appeared on the Real Housewives of Orange County from 2012 through 2016, and she has just rejoined the cast for its newest season. So as you'll hear, you know, Heather is married to a world-renowned plastic surgeon, Dr. Terry Dubrow, star of E's hit TV series, Botched. They have four children, and they live in Newport Beach, California, where she spoke to me from her very fancy home studio. Heather, thank you so much. I really have been looking forward to talking to you. I'm really excited about it. Thanks for asking me. Uh, Awesome. So I'll just tell you a little bit about me. You know, I'm an anchor on CNN, and I've been asked to fill in on this podcast for a few weeks. And I said, they said, you can talk about anything. And I said, I'm really interested in talking about parenting teenagers. I have three of them. I have a set of twins, just like you do. Mm -hmm. So I have twin 16-year-olds. I think yours are 17. Yep. Okay. And I have a 14 year old, so twin girls and a 14 year old boy. And, you know, I remember well being a teenager. I remember what a turbulent time that is. And I am continuously struck by how far the pendulum has swung from, I was a teenager of the eighties, the free range eighties, where we went days without seeing our parents. I don't know where parents were during the eighties, but they weren't home. And now the helicopter parenting. And so for somebody like you, I'm so fascinated by you for a number of reasons, which is you have lived your life. You and your husband live a a pretty public life. And so I'm wondering about raising children in that milieu. And also, you know, to be honest, you, you guys are a family of privilege. And I wonder about how you, if you have to consciously kind of build resilience or how you go about doing that with your kids, given that they have a lot of wealth and privilege. So those are those yeah. are my my questions for you. So tell me your philosophy, wherever you want to start, but just tell me your philosophy yeah, on, on parenting. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of questions, Allison. All right, <laughs> let's dive in here. First of all, I think, I don't know how old you are, but I grew up in the 80s too. Right and on. so, um, you know, I grew up in, in those times too, where we were gone for days and days and we didn't have phones and things. And our parents just trusted that we would come home eventually. Like, I, I don't really know what that was, but yeah. Uh, My parents were actually very strict Hmm. and it led me and my sister to rebel. I mean, I was a kid, if you can believe it, who would sneak out of the house and like do all kinds of crazy things because I was 
really like sort of strangled. Okay, have, stop right or, there. Stop right there. Hold yeah. on, because I'm interested in this. Oh, look, everybody I know snuck out of the house. Okay, that was yeah. what we did in the 80s. And so yeah. when you would rebel, just what what form did that take? What did that look like in your teenage years? I think just everything. I mean, we, you know, I grew up in Westchester, New York. It There was a lot of, you know, time. There was a lot of space. There was money around and it was boring. So, you know, there was sex, drugs and rock and roll. I mean, that, that's basically what we did in high school. You know, I was still always kind of fancy. You know, I was never into like keggers and stuff like that. But we'd, we'd go to the local mini mart with our fake IDs and get bottles of cheap champagne and you know, have an evening. And that's totally, I totally relate to this. I mean, I, I grew up in suburban New Jersey and it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll for, for teenagers in a way that yeah. right now, I don't feel like it is, you know, because we're, they're under our watchful eye, they can't mm. do all that stuff. And obviously it's a double-edged sword. I wish that they could have some level of freedom that we had, but they, do they need to be around that many that much alcohol and drugs? No, they don't, you know? I guess, but you know, what I find so interesting about like, all right, so my twins, I have boy-girl twins that are almost 18. They're 17. They're going to their senior year of high school. I have a daughter who's 14, almost 15, and then a daughter who's 10, almost 11. So um, what's interesting to me is they're completely not interested in sex, drugs. Well, let's just say they're not interested in drugs and alcohol. They're not, they're just not interested in that. And unlike my mother, who was very 1950s and, and, you know, sort of closed off and didn't talk about anything, we talk about everything. We have a very, very open relationship, which I love. And also I'm sort of of the mindset that if you let them have their freedom and trust them, there's no reason not to trust them until they prove otherwise. So I've always given them a ton of freedom because I really do trust them. Having said that, like they don't have a curfew. My kids have never had a curfew, but my son was out the other night till 1 a.m., right? And and I said yeah. to him, I go, look, I trust you. I know you don't drink. And I know even if you one day decide to drink, I know you'd never drive. I said, but the problem is the other people out on the road, yeah. they, they, it's likely that they've been drinking. So I just don't want you in the wrong place at the wrong time. So do me a favor. If you're going to come home late, like just stay over wherever you are, come home in the morning, just make good choices. But they, I think, you know, giving them that freedom has allowed them to to make the better choices because I do trust them. I love that. I love that parenting philosophy. That was my mother's philosophy. I had a, a different experience than you did. My you mother- You still snuck out of the house though. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't even have to sneak out. Like in other words, my friends were, were sneaking out, but I didn't have to sneak out because I had such a, a late curfew that it just, I didn't, I could talk to my mm -hmm. mother about anything too. So I was- I just had a lot of freedom. I had a lot of freedom and a lot of independence, but I find that this era doesn't allow for that as much. So I think that that's really interesting. Why don't your teenagers, why aren't your teenagers interested in drugs and alcohol? It's a good question because, you know, I, I, I like a cocktail. So, you know, it's not like they're not seeing what we're doing, but um, I think partially it has to do with the fact, so my husband's um, late brother, his name was Kevin Dubrow. He was the lead singer of Quiet Riot. Mm -hmm. If you remember, come on, feel the of noise. Course. Who doesn't? Yeah. Of course. Right. So he died of an accidental overdose. Mm. You know, he, yeah, he, it was about a decade ago, but he, um, he wasn't a, 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 a an addict or a druggie or anything, but it was like, you know, where we'd go out and have one too many drinks. And then I could say, go, Oh, bad plan. Let me not do that again. Yeah. He went out and took the wrong combination of things, went to bed and never woke up. Oh, you know, he horrible. was 52 at that age. You, you mm. know, your heart can't take that sort of thing. And we've always talked about it in our house. So they've always been aware of that and the dangers of certain drugs. And we've always preached, you know, look, legal things in the right, you know, in doing responsibly are fine. Like, why not enjoy your life and whatever, but they're just really not interested. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think it's partially generational yeah. and partially maybe just them, but I, I'm glad about it. But the one thing I worry about is I don't want them to go off to college and like explode, which is why I'm always like, have a glass of wine. You're home or we're in Mexico. There's no drinking age here. It's okay. When the, when the lockdown happened, I bought a six pack. I don't think I've ever told anyone this, but I bought it. Um, I bought a six pack of white claw. Yeah. I, like cool mom. Right. I'm like, here, everyone's on lockdown. Mm -hmm. Have a white claw. And they were like, wow. And they poured it, both of them, they poured it, took a sip, put it down, walked away. That was it. 
Right. And by the way, you're you're singing my tune right now. This is exactly how I feel. I am worried about them going off to college. And I feel like I have to toughen them up. I feel like I have to toughen them up somehow with sex, drugs, and alcohol. I mean, I don't know why that's my responsibility, but I feel like I don't want to send my kids to college without experience in those realms because I guess I have heard one too many stories about binge drinking and or sexual assault on campus. And I just want to know that they're equipped to deal with if you've had too much to drink, what do you do at a frat party? If you've had too much to drink, how do you find your way home? And so I am I am worried, but my kids are the same as yours. Like I try to foist wine on them. When we're in Italy, I try to give them wine diluted with water. They're not interested. Not, no. And so I don't know what's going to happen. I still think they're learning the lessons. I mean, they, they're learning lessons that we don't even know exist. I mean, I've heard of kids... And, and I'm sure you've obviously heard in the news, kids that have died from getting, you know, drugs on Snapchat and they order one thing and they end up with something else and end up dying or, you know, having a serious problem because that my kids see all that. And they've told me about things like that. One thing I think that's pretty cool, I'll use my son as an example, like he he will go to a party and he will tell me, you know, oh, we're, we were playing beer pong or whatever they're playing. I go, so how do you play and not drink? And he's like, oh, I have so-and-so. I give him the drinks. He's interested. I'm not. And But I love the self-confidence that he has that he's not interested. So it's cool. And by the way, he's tried some things and he has shared that with me, but it wasn't his thing. So I think they're getting the experiences that they need to get and they're learning how to stand up for themselves. Um, One of the other things you asked me is about being in the public eye and privilege. And I want to comment on both those things. Um, So being in the public and especially, you know, doing a podcast, again, very 1950s parents that talked about nothing and shoved everything under the rug. I have diarrhea of the mouth. I will talk about absolutely anything. (laughs) But when it comes to your children and you're a public person too, you know this, you have to walk the line. I mean, there's only sanctioned photos that are allowed on the Instagram. And, you know, one year I posted a picture of um, the twins' first day of school and they were so pissed that I had to take it down. And so I put up a picture of some random twins and I wrote, these are not my children, <laughs> but I hope they have a good first day of school because they were so mad at me. <laughs> but so why were they I pissed? Talked, why, did, why were they pissed that you posted it? Because a lot of their um, friends follow me and their parents follow me and they just thought it was cringy and embarrassing. I don't know. They're better now, but this was like a couple of years ago. But I really do have to walk the line with what I talk about. So I I try to take my cues from them and talk about things they are willing to talk about. Thankfully, my da- my oldest daughter, she has a podcast called I'll Give It To You Straightish. She came out as bisexual a couple of years ago. And she's very comfortable and confident speaking about um, anxiety and therapy and meds and, and, and sexuality and all that. So I have a little more leeway with her that I can speak about because she's already put it out there, Mm -hmm. but I do try to balance it all to be authentic and share my life, but not ruin theirs in the process. And so how much do you divulge? Do you, what do you divulge about your past and in, in all of those realms publicly, like sex, drugs, and alcohol? Yeah, in my past, I pretty much talk about everything. I, the only things I don't talk about because my mother is alive is um, anything that would really upset her because there's no reason for that. But maybe someday I'll, you know, unlock that box. We'll see what happens. But my life is a pretty open book. I don't have that much to hide. When I joined Housewives, you know, I had been a scripted actress for years and then I had four kids in seven years and then, you know, this crazy reality thing. And I said to Terry, I was like, oh my gosh, reality television, what are they going to find out about me? You know, and he goes, what have you done? I'm like, well, I don't know, in high school. He's like, if we're going back to high school, you're fine. So I don't think I'm such a controversial person, but um, I do like to talk and be open about all of the things about, you know, with my kids about sexuality and their bodies and and things that that people just didn't talk to me and my sister about. I do too. I like talk. I love talking to my kids about that. And I love that they come to me and talk to me. My kids are at camp right now. My girls are at camp. And of course there's all sorts of sex talk and, and stuff. And they're learning like their ears are wide open, eyes wide open because they're getting a total earful at camp and they are calling me and telling me stories. (laughs) I'm like, wow. Okay. That's graphic. 
Like <laughs> even if I talked to my mother about it, I didn't describe graphic detail. Not They're not describing their own experience. They're relating stories to me in like graphic detail. I was like, okay, I guess I'm glad you're comfortable telling me about things that are extremely graphic. Um, and I am happy that they are, but, but, yeah. but you on, on your podcast and on your reality show, do you divulge anything about your own like past sex life or anything like that? You know, I've been married for like a hundred years. I don't even know if I remember my past sex life, but if something came up, I would. Although what's funny is we were just talking about this the other day. The thing is when you're single and you talk about like your, es you know, your escapades and like whatever, mm -hmm. it's kind of hot, right? Once you get married, no one's interested. No one wants to hear so about true. your sex life when you're married. It's not like your husband walks by you and says to his friend, like, oh, I'm going to tap that later. Like, that just doesn't <laughs> happen. No one wants to know. I'm it's very true. lucky. We love each other. We have a fantastic sex life. You know, and and like on my show, I'll talk about it. We went away. We had hotel sex. Like, everyone needs that and needs to get away. <laughs> but like, not in graphic detail. Again, I, I don't think anyone wants to hear about it. Mm -hmm. So about you going back to Real Housewives, um, is that a was that a family decision? I mean, did you talk oh, 100 to 100%. percent, mm -hmm. 100 percent. And, you know, speaking about that, you, you also mentioned, you know, having children of privilege. So yes, I do want to know about that. So I grew up in Westchester. You know, we I, we had a very nice life. We had a very nice house. Terry grew up in Van Nuys. He had um, his parents were married multiple times, both of them. And they had step siblings, you know, siblings and the whole thing. And, it, you know, we didn't grow, and even though I grew up with a very nice life, I didn't grow up like this. We didn't have this kind of house. We didn't fly private. We didn't have staff and, and all this stuff. And so, you know, we've always worried, are they going to be douchebags? Like, are we raising assholes? Like, how do you keep your kids grounded? And, you know, you think about nature and nurture. And I think the truth is, it's mostly nature. I think they come out the way they come out. We're lucky to have, you know, I would say our, our kids are nice. They're, they're nice kids. And I'd like to think I had some, you know, something to do with molding that and teaching and, and listening. And I, and I think the one thing that maybe we've done well is the communication skills. And I think that's what's led them, um, to remain pretty grounded. But I remember like my son, when he was like in se sixth grade, seventh grade, something, he didn't do well on something and he was just being lazy about school and whatever. And I went, look around. This is our life, not yours. No one writes you a check when you leave this house. You're invited to be a part of our life, but you're going to have to make your own way. That you're welcome for this great start, but you got to figure it out. And he was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's really interesting. I, I'm interested in this because my, I'll just share with you my bias. Yeah. That I know is not, it's just an emotional bias. I know intellectually it's it's not true, but because I was uh, a child of divorce, yes, I grew up a white girl in the suburbs. So obviously there was inherent privilege in that. However, yeah. my parents were divorced. My mother was a school teacher. My father's uh, child support checks were spotty. And so I, what I, when I wanted something, uh, an album or a piece of clothing, I used my babysitting money. You had to work for it. I had to work for it. I got a job as a bus girl the day I turned 16. I've worked every day since then. And so I have always thought that those were the character building um, experiences. Terry says the same thing. Yeah. And so without those, if you don't, if you're not coming from a place of hunger and deprivation and fear. Yeah. And fear, like all of that stuff. I don't know how you necessarily build resilience and character in, in, in rich kids. And passion. I mean, you're such a passionate person. I mean, you have to be to do what you do. Same with me, same with Terry and what he does. And, you know, it's funny because Terry really came from that same kind of life where he had, he worked at, you know, Kentucky fried chicken. He calls it Colonel Sanders. Cause he's like a hundred, but he, he worked at Kentucky <laughs> fried chicken. And, and he always tells the story. Like I, I did my paper route uphill both ways in the snow in California and the kids laughed and whatever. Totally. I didn't have that. I had a bit more privilege growing up as a white girl in the suburbs in a non-broken home with, you know, a dad who was an attorney and, you know, that really nice life. But I was born with that kind of fire and, and that kind of passion for what I loved to do. So I was lucky. 
I think that when I look at my four kids, they're on, you have three kids, you know, they're all so different. And I used to worry about this. And I used to worry how, because Terry kept saying, how are they going to fire? How are they? And you know what? Not everyone needs fire. They need to be independent, functioning, healthy humans. And so that it's just so gratifying to watch that. Like my son hates school. He just does. And his twin sister is very academic. They couldn't be more polar opposite. And she knows what she wants to do. She knows where she's going. She's got it all figured out. And he doesn't. He'll say things like, I'm going to go where the wind takes me. But he's the happiest, one of the happiest people I know. Because he's just that guy. And so he may not have that fire, and he, but I know he'll be successful in life. So I think his parents, one of the best advice I can give, because you were talking about helicopter parenting before, is to chill out and take a step back because it's not your life. It's theirs. I love that. And I also do believe, like you said, I think that uh, it, some of it's just genetic. Some yeah. of it's genetic. They're just born who they are. And so we think it's our responsibility to create all of this for them, even resilience, but uh, maybe it's genetic. Maybe they're, you know, maybe because I have twins and you have twins, we've been able to do this experiment. Right. So they were born at exactly the same time. They were raised in exactly the same house with exactly the same philosophy and they're completely different. Yeah. And so how much of it are we as parents really controlling anyway? It's true. And I think also with the helicopter parenting, I mean, one of the schools that um, a couple of my kids went to, there were such tiger moms. I mean, like when summertime came, I'd say, oh, let's send them to a camp. Like, or should we do a volleyball camp or this? They're like, oh, she's going to Mandarin lessons and Mandarin camp and then writing camp and then at UCI and then this and then that. I was like, oh boy, like, you know, where's the summer? And um, look, if that's your jam, I'm not trying to be judgmental about it, but I think that they have so little time to be kids these days that I just, I mean, like, I love that your kids are, they're at sleepaway camp mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. I love that. It's the best thing. They get to unplug, they get a break from social media and they just get to do all these beautiful old fashioned things. And my kids have been to sleepaway camp too. And it was one of the best experiences for them. I just absolutely love that. Me too. And they get freedom. I mean, which they just, my kids, I, I'm not proud of this. I mean, I'm embarrassed by how little freedom they have, but that's the life that we're living in. You know, they're, they're not free range. They are sometimes scheduled within an inch of their lives. It's just sort of how the, I don't know, the, this era of they do have different activities and they do take their schoolwork really seriously and have a shitload of homework. Yeah. Um, so, so at camp, they have freedom. Although my 10 year old, I think she is reaping the benefits or not. I'll let you know in 10 years of, mm -hmm. you know, the first two had a lot of things, a lot of schedules, a lot of activities, a lot of all of that. And then, you know, as you start adding children, you have less time and can't be in four places at the same time and all of that. So she's actually much less scheduled than the first two were. But I think what's also important for parents to understand is that all these years, these young years, they're for us more than they're for the kids because they remember none of it. I mean, do you remember anything <laughs> before you're 25, really? No, I don't remember what happened in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. I mean, like a memory of so-and-so being mean to me or trying to kiss so-and-so uh. on the playground. But like those, those you don't remember. Don't you remember graduating college and being like, and or maybe even graduating high school, going to college. Now my life is beginning. Now my life is my own. And so I look at the twins and I go like, I, yes, of course, I'm going to be very sad, um, when they go off to college, but also so happy for them that they are starting their next adventure and I get to watch it and experience it and, you know, the whole thing. So I think parents need, really need to remember that they, these beginning years are for us. So if you're running around crazy and going from thing to thing to thing to thing, thing that the kids hate and they're crying and you're schlepping them around, stop doing it because they will not remember and you will end, they will end up quitting and all you will remember from all these years is how hard you worked for nothing. I totally agree. So that was fascinating to me. I really love Heather's confidence about what she's doing and how she's parenting. I disagree that we don't remember anything before we're 25 because I remember my teenage years so vividly, but I take her point that 
if you're just going from event to event to event and you're over scheduled, you've overscheduled your kids, you yourself are feeling stressed and pressured, what is the point? Honestly, you know, I do believe we have to open it up for some breathing room for the kids and for us. And if they're on their own and if they have to muddle through their day and figure out some meals on their own or how to get from place to place without you shuttling them around, all the better. I mean, again, I just think that that is what builds self-reliance, which I think is, shouldn't that be, you know, one of our most important goals? Um, and anyway, you know, look, Heather, let's be honest, is a super privileged parent. Her kids are super privileged kids. This is a very wealthy family. But uh, I'm interested in how you don't raise brats. So Heather and I talk about that. So uh, our next episode is on Thursday, and we're going to hear more just about how she does it, being super wealthy and trying to raise still good human beings and good citizens. And remember to subscribe to Distraction wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. Distraction is created by Sounds Great Media. Our producer is Sarah Gurton. And special thanks to Emma Marshall, Melissa Blum, and Caitlin Goldsmith. I'm Allison Camerata. Thanks for listening.